question of anarchism at, perceived as being a kind of infantile philosophy that appeals to the impulses of you know adolescents who want to rebel and who basically adopt all the trappings of anarchism you know the black clothing and the the, the circle the the a in the circle and well, let's talk about that, that the first one to say that by the way i think was clemenceau he said, you've never been young if you weren't an anarchist sometime in your life. That's a loose quotation. I mean, I'm not giving you an exact, you know, quote. And uh, there's another feature, too, and that is a very important feature, and that is that anarchists have not defined themselves. The word anti-authoritarian typically is negative. It's not a definition in positive terms, you see. So consequently, one doesn't so much hold a vision of what the, a new society should be like and even discuss and quarrel, which is quite healthy, over that vision or various competing visions. One makes competing visions an end in itself. The result is that you cannot appeal to any large number of people. It becomes esoteric. It becomes a subtle doctrine, you see. And it suffers sometimes from a degree of subtlety that makes it completely incoherent. And let me say, too, and this is important, which had a profound effect upon my experience with anarchists, not just the question of our ideas, and that is the fact that anarchists value this incoherence. They make that a fetish. They value it. And that finds itself expressed in many different ways. Not only in ideas, but even in procedure and even in organization. The idea is the more coherent you are, the more authoritarian you are. This is an absurdity because we're not only looking, uh, we're not only if, let me put it more precisely, we, if we were looking for a common idea, okay, tried to fetishize incoherence, we'd be working against rationality. Science predicates itself on coherence. The debate within science or between scientists in the same field is the idea to unify, unify reality, to find what its common denominators are, to find what its uh, sensibility and susceptibility to a unity, to a coherent and meaningful world is. And this is the highest form of morality, the highest form of morality. To make a fetish out of the idea that you are incomprehensible or that your theories are incomprehensible is to actually subvert the possibility of creating a movement and building yourself on a form of individualism. That's where the real individualism that anarchists have been accused of comes into play. The idea above all that you should not be comprehensible. And that is a, an abdication, a total abdication of the idea that you should build a movement. From this came the terrorist script in anarchism, the idea of the heroic individual who would change the world. And you know, if you want to really look at it, it's a very elitist point of view. I took what was generally regarded as the popular image of anarchism, not the terrorist, uh, you know, that idiotic notion of anarchy as being bomb-throwing and the rest. I took the more sophisticated image of anarchy, namely anti-authoritarianism, a word I'm sure you've heard repeatedly, the formation of new movements, movements in particular that drew from the entire socialist or, if you like, communist tradition, and tried to see what they had in common 
and how they melded together to create a unified movement. That was important. The most important thing is what that movement stood for, not simply what that movement was against. It was easy enough to find people who would insist and agree with me, as they agreed with each other, I'm quite sure, that you had that capitalism was irrational, minimally that it was irrational, that it was an irrational social order, and that you had to bring rationality to a social order that sought the public good, tried to maximize, if I may use a term that I don't particularly like, but tried to maximize the possibilities of ever-emerging developments in technology, ever-emerging developments in insight into the natural world, inside into the relationship of people to each other and unify that into a coherent body of ideas. That, I assumed, was the one image I could work with in anarchism. I couldn't do that in the communist movement, and I would not call it communism, but exactly the communist or Stalinist movement. That was closed. The door was closed on that issue with the emergence of the Bolsheviks. And with that, also the betrayals of the social democrats who in turn closed the door, so far as I was concerned, on conventional Marxism. And I want to distinguish here very plainly between Karl Marx's writing and development. He changed his point of view very radically from the early part of his life to its middle part and to the latter part of Marxian ideas. The changes were incredible. Most people are not cognizant of them. It's only now that we have, in English, I point to the 40 volumes of Marx's collected works, that we have access to points of view that Marx never expressed in the conventional format that Stalinism gave it. So I had neither social democracy, Marxism, and therefore I was left with only one thing, a conventional but at least sophisticated anti-authoritarian and more importantly utopian vision of a rational society. And that rationality was totally closed to me by the development of capitalism, which turned out to be a, a, the account, the history in a sense, of a movement that always turned anything that could have served the public good into a worse evil, most, include, most decisively the uses of technology. There, everything from a pen knife to a nuclear reactor is designed in one way or another to do some harm and is used most effectively for sinister and frankly evil purposes. But what I was doing, unbeknownst to me, was not working with the mergers that had taken place in all these different social movements. Karl Marx was not simply an authoritarian. He was also, in his own way, a libertarian. And books have been written demonstrating that fact very, very effectively. And one has to account for how these relationships interacted with each other in Marx's own mind and in the movements that Marx participated and to some extent even founded, like the First International. It must be remembered that the inaugural address of the First International, one of the most libertarian statements uh, written and promulgated by a mass movement, the International Workingmen's Association, which we now call the First International, that inaugural address, which says that only the working class can liberate itself, that famous line, which has appeared on endless 
amicus periodicals was written by guess who? Karl Marx. And these things have to be squared off, squared off, and their relationship historically and theoretically have to be clearly defined. But they never were, not to my satisfaction anyway. So the point is that when I met you, I was looking for something that would spring the trap that conventional versions of Marxism, of communism, of uh, anarchism had created for me. And I would exclude anarchism at that time because anarchism was so ill-defined that anything you wanted to believe would be as acceptable as anything else. It made no difference. And as I said, this, at least for the anarchists, was deliberate, whereas for all the other movements, it was not. It was due to the unintended consequences of fights within the movements themselves. What I was giving you in point of fact, or trying to present to people who were reading my works, was a version of a libertarian movement that approximated syndicalism. When Joe Hill famously wrote his parting statement to all before he was going to be uh, shot by a Utah was a firing squad, said, don't mourn, organize, this would have offended thousands of anarchists. It was exactly not to organize, but to think of a revolution emerging completely spontaneously that people who called themselves anarchists believed in. Yet it was accepted, as things will be accepted. Don't mourn, organize, was a syndicalist statement if it was authoritarian, anti-authoritarian in its premises. That's not what Joe, that's not what the anarchists believed in. And many anarchists, most famously Malatesta, condemned syndicalism when it was being presented in the 1890s and early 1900s for being authoritarian, for being, quote, stogmatic because it was systematic, relatively speaking, condemned these movements. And that fight never ended. It never ended. So I didn't realize, first of all, the nature of the fight and what was at its root. And I gradually assimilated more and more a deeper understanding, at least as I thought, of anarchism when in the book that I wrote not too long ago, Social Anarchism or Lifestyle Anarchism, in which I emphasized as a result of my studies of postmodernism, get it straight, this is the joke, as a result of my studies of postmodernism, that anarchism was a lifestyle. It was primarily a lifestyle. And I had been imputing, when I talked about organization to it, when I talked about organization and the importance of building movements, and the anarchists were opposed to mass movements, incidentally, I didn't realize that I was mouthing, basically, certain syndicalist notions which were antithetical to anarchism. Anarchism was an individual philosophy, and it had its roots, quite understandably, in Max Stirner. And not surprisingly, it has been, Stirner has been adopted by every point of view you can think of pretty nearly, including certain fascists. But it was an individualistic tendency. Syndicalism emphasized the autonomy of the individual. And that word autonomy was more important in syndicalism than words like freedom. Freedom, in fact, was identified with individual autonomy. And nothing was more antithetical to the syndicalists than the idea that they should uh, reduce their movement to mainly individual autonomy, which is what the anarchists were trying to do. This fight went on in Spain 
very markedly in the, pu in the public view.